Okay. What does day one look like? You know you're taking over from James Gorman. January 1, do you kick him out of the office and put the photos <laughs> down? How does it work? Well, first of all, James is still the boss. And uh, it's a great question. Um, you remember that uh, Robert Redford movie, The Candidate? Go on. And uh, he gets elected and he says, uh, now what? There's an element of that. That's now what? It what? Feels like. That's a very well, honest response. Going, I mean, that's an honest, you know, it's like going back to school. 31 years at the firm that I love. They hired me out of college. They took me back after business school and now I get to represent the team. You know, it's, a, it's an awe-inspiring moment. You know, you're carrying the culture of a place that's been around for almost 90 years. And as you guys know, a place that like looked at the abyss six dollars and 71 cents in october of 08 and now here we are flourishing and so my job is to keep going what james has done so brilliantly and uh we're spending a ton of time together it's a blast i learned something from him literally with every interaction and so uh super psyched we've been doing these dinners together with clients client meetings together and it's uh, it's a real thrill for me you went there you talked about 2008 i think the bank that gorman took over from mac back in 2010 it's a very different one to the one you're inheriting today if we can fast forward similar time frame another 10 years let's talk about what you want Morgan Stanley to look like in the future I think a lot of people have taken your recent comments as a continuity candidate at the top of the bank yep. do you see any big changes on the horizon over the next decade or so what James did is he laid the seeds he not only transformed the place but he uh, reclaimed the best of the culture so uh, my job is to take the moats that have been built through transformation in wealth and asset management, whereas you know we have about six and a half trillion of assets under management, and a world-class investment bank, pretty tough to compete as a global investment bank now. There are only three or four of those wealth managers, only three or four of those global investment banks, and he reclaimed that culture, and now to press on integrating the two. One ecosystem. Individual is now a walking institution. Institution now needs hedging expertise that requires certain capabilities that individuals typically wouldn't have. So sort of the migration of financial sponsors across the pockets. Uh, I think it's incredibly exciting, and we'd like to think we're differentiated from any of our competitors. We have competitors that are great wealth managers. We have competitors that are great investment banks. But to bring them both together is, is, is something special. And the reason, Jonathan, I think we can do it is really born of the experience of the financial crisis. When, when you make it, you either are imprisoned by that forever, or you say, we made it, let's keep the good stuff, and let's be something more. So I'm, I'm, I'm focused on integrating the firm across those two verticals. You grew up in the investment bank, and yet you're really leading into the wealth management. Yeah. And on the earnings call, you talked about how the wealth management's in your blood, how your father-in-law and your father yes. uh, were both in the business. And you said, this will be the engine for further Morgan Stanley growth, kind of uh, underpinning some of your comments. Do you have a place in mind where further acquisitions will transpire in terms of the wealth management units. Well, first of all, I want you to know that um, you've made at least one 80-year-old man very excited by <laughs> mentioning on air. Okay, so this, 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 this actually makes my day entirely. Uh, you can name drop him. Go ahead. You know, I, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, listen, I think, I think the reality is uh, inorganic opportunities are going to come across the transom. But the, the danger, and, and James talked about it, the danger of acquisitions, you know, they're sort of asymmet asymmetrically against you, right? Because first, the financial proposition has to work, the business strategy has to work, and then the integration has to work. And we did it twice, right, in COVID. We did, we did, we did E-Trade, which I loved, because it kind of gave us enough size. It was diluted, but that didn't matter. It gave us enough size that we're going to make it. And we saw how things can get in March, and then the aftermath in Europe. And then Eaton Vance gave us solutions. So stuff is going to come across the transom. I'm not sure we need to be in a rush because, again, we don't have sort of the victory's curse of thinking we just sort of do these things. I think there's enough organically. But I'm glad you, you, you mentioned Lisa because I think when you're talking about five or ten years and you think about the amount of aggregation and transparency of wealth outside the U.S., particularly in Asia, you know, we're 22 percent owned by our friends at Mitsubishi, who literally saved us during the financial crisis. Uh, I've been going a lot to Japan. I go every quarter. We've doubled down on Japan. Imagine, just as sort of like a vision thought, imagine wealth in Japan five to ten years from now when you come off the zero rate, you know, the zero barrier. Asset allocation, wealth opportunity, investment banking. I mean, it's one example of, a, of the kind of place where we could do extraordinary business. 
Does that mean that you're de-emphasizing the investment bank, that it doesn't matter as much to kind of compete head-to-head -head with Goldman Sachs in terms of the league tables in the same sure. kind of way as traditionally? Sure. What I love is that we've got a business strategy that you can do in the elevator, literally like two floors. Wealth and asset manager, big scale. Global investment bank, big scale. And it's not actually a choice because increasingly there's synergies between the two. And I think it is absolutely important that the investment bank is agile enough that when the markets are speaking to forward volumes, early cycle behavior, which is, by the way, where I think we're, we are now, cross-border M&A ahead of the U.S. election, uh, folks wanting to deploy capital as the Fed gets going, uh, you want to be in the core investment banking business. We had four years of no IPOs. The sponsor uh, assets have gotten big. How many companies are, how many underwriters can be used to take these companies public? Half a dozen around the world. How many people are going to be uh, 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 acting as advisors on cross-border large cap M&A? Two or three. That's high margin business. And, and, and the reason it's so important is it's the tip of the spear. It's the intellectual capital that the firm has been traditionally known for. And what is informed in part by our history of the 90s merger and then our crisis, our human capital crisis in 05, is that the investment bank has so embraced wealth and vice versa because what James did, you know, this is McKinsey at his true best, is for these 14 years, he migrated people around the firm. So you have people actually understand these businesses. Andy Saperstein, one of our co-presidents, worked in uh, the investment bank, now running wealth and asset. Dan Simquist turned around our asset management business, now he's running the investment bank. So it's not that I'm trying to sell you the story, I've been there kind of thing, and it gets people motivated and we're motivated to hit 20% returns on tangible. You alluded to it. We had a bank CEO earlier this week who just said it out loud. Investment banking's been in recession for the last couple Absolutely. of years. It's been really, really tough. Absolutely. I hear you communicating the end of it. Can that happen? I hate to be the guy who asks about Fitz. the Federal Reserve and, and rate cuts. Can that end without rate cuts from the Federal Reserve? Can we end that IB recession, given what you see in the ah, pipeline? I hear you guys talk about this every morning. <laughs> I, I, and, and once when I said, we don't know. Who knows? Um, I think the path is uh, probably that inflation has passed. Um, but you know, there's a tail. There's a five or ten percent probability they do fifty in March. I'm not talking about 50, five to ten percent, right? It's forty to sixty percent they do twenty-five in March. There's also, if you price an exotic, five to ten percent possibility that we have another hike in us. I, I kind of did that check thinking of you two guys because it is possible that we either, because every time the Fed talks about it, right, as they did uh, in the reverse in the teens, you know, it, it tightened up and they didn't go. Now it's, they talk about it, loosens up. It's like, okay, we don't want to have the, the Arthur Burns bit. We don't want it to get away from us. So we're going we're gonna to do it when we're ready. I think the big picture, though, is they're going to start lowering at some point when they're ready they're going to be prudent they're going to be thoughtful and that kind of predictability is very good for the core investment banking business because you have these financial sponsor portfolios that have been locked up that need to be liberated some can go in continuation funds some can go to other sponsors but some have to go public or be sold and then the corporate dynamic was folks are ready to get going then with three years of pandemic there's always going to be an election there's always going to be macro but i think the core investment banking activity that we have known with with real cost of capital, traditional corporate finance like the mid-90s, I think it's going to come back. We've been hearing from bank executive after bank executive, it's time to start ramping up hiring. They're going to be going out there and building their teams. You doing the same thing? We have our team. We have our team. So no more hiring? Well, I, 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 believe, I believe that um, you know, investment banks are notoriously pro-cyclical. You know, so we see a trend and then we'll go hire a bunch of traders or hire a bunch of bankers. You know, if you really believe in you know, the, the kind of what the culture represents, you don't want to be too herky-jerky about that, especially in the world with higher fixed compensation and longer, longer tenures and the stickiness. Um, will we hire a specific banker for sp a specific space who wants to come onto our platform? For example, we've been hiring in Paris. Uh, we've been hiring in Tokyo. Uh, we've been picking up uh, uh, M&A bankers along the way. But I, I do like the partnership right now. I really like uh, the team, and you know they're they're fired up to go. There's always going to be a range of views on your stock. I'm just bringing up the stock on the yep. Bloomberg terminal right now. I can yep. bring up the analyst recommendation screen. I've got 10 buys, 20 holds, no sells. Let's talk about one of the holds, one of the changes in the last couple of days. It came from J.P. Morgan. They had good things to say, but they said this: We see the excellent acquisition benefits largely discounted. See limited stock specific catalysts in the near term. We've got to deal with analysts now and again. Some people might be saying stuff you don't like. They're neutral. It's not exactly a sell. But what would you say back to that? Limited stock-specific catalysts in the near term. Stock had a big run. It's trading at the midpoint of the 700 range, trading 85-ish. Uh, um, reality is that uh, 
continues to be a, a great capital return story. We have a capital buffer, we pay a dividend, we're in two growth businesses, the strategy's unchanged. Uh, the James Gorman premium, it's been a real premium, and uh, I wanna make sure I have credibility with the marketplace. He did it for 14 years, I've been in for about 14 days. Uh, so I, I was sort of joking, he's 728 weeks, and I've done two, so the score is 728 to two. And then he said, but it's not that bad, it's only 3,528 trading days, and so we went back and forth on that, <laughs> but because he said you'd get vacation. Um, I think the reality <laughs> is that, um, the reality is that People, some people want to know that we get to 30% PBT margins of wealth immediately. Um, there's always going to be that sort of knee jerk. But you know, we were four six with Dean Witter, eight, 12, 15, 20. One of the things that James did brilliantly, as your team knows, you guys know, Shredar knows, is he kind of always did the post and beat durably, durably. It, you know, these these firms have been traditionally marked on price to book. And what, it, what we want to do, which is differentiate, is get people to look at the P multiple, which means they can run the DCF. So that's important to me, that there's predictability and durability. You have to go. I know that. But I do want to ask you, is it true that you can multiply any numbers whatsoever in your head in a second? I, you know, who knows? 563 times 360. Everyone wants to do that. Everyone wants to do that. I'm a rounding guy. Let's I know. just do rounding. All right, we'll do that. I'm going to run the numbers after the show. Hey, Ted, it's great. We're looking forward to following the journey Thanks, with you.